Prince Asamoah is a student with the University of Ghana. Al Hassan Tahiru Manaf is a student activist. They are my guests. We're talking. Uh, do you believe in Ghana? And what do you think is in Commander Greatest? Prince, good morning. Do you believe in Ghana? Good morning. I generally believe in people, so consequently, I believe in Ghana. Yes. Ebe you. Okay. Um, do you believe in Ghana? I believe in Ghana. Okay. What is it about Ghana that is it the country? Is it the name? Is it the flag? The country Ghana has a history, and that is something most people have forgotten. That this is once a continent, or this is once a country that the world respected so much at the bashing of what democracy, at the heaven of the rule of law, and the fact that it demonstrated so clearly that indeed the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. And things have happened over the years. But looking at where we find ourselves and projecting into the future, looking at the current trend of what youths in this country, and myself as a youth activist, I strongly believe in Ghana and that the future prospects are very, very bright. Okay. So, Prince, you say you believe in the people. Yeah. Um, I believe in people. I believe generally that people have the ability to change even if they are not in the best state now. I don't agree with Manaf and the point that the current trend or the current people are in a position to really change Ghana. I have always said that even the youth of today, especially studying my contemporaries, I feel like we need a new crop of people because even the youth of today have been infected. I think we need a new breed of self-sacrificing people. So just like how people coming from the war back in South Korea when it was one of the poorest countries in the world, just changed their attitudes and became a self-sacrificing people for their country and now their country has one of the best economies in the world. I think that we could have a group of people like that who would come to Ghana and help us. But looking at the current trends of the leaders we have in power and the youth who are going to take over from these leaders, I have my, my doubts. But because I believe in people, I think Ghana could make it. But for you, the leaders we have now and those who are coming up to take over, we are like the same. Yeah, we're basically the same. Because I look at how people talk on political platforms, even on campus or these student groups, and you realize that it's almost always the same old rhetoric. It's almost the same old, oh, we'll change, and then they come and then they do the same things, just like these mm. people that we always criticize. So it has become this vicious cycle where we just keep doing the same things over and over again and expect different results. Mm. And that is why I think that we are not really in the mood for change now, especially when even these current group of people that we think are going to change are being paid and picked, handpicked, paid and controlled by these same people that mm. we think are bad. So it, it's become very difficult unless we have a new breed of people, maybe the children who are being born in 2018 and then we decide to cut them off from the rest of Ghana or the rest of society and train them anew. Really? I have my doubts. Yeah. Okay. Very drastic measures you think we should take. Yeah. Very drastic. Um, uh, Hassan Tahir, yes. is Nkrumah the greatest ever? Nkrumah is the greatest ever. And uh, you cannot reduce Nkrumah to Ghana. Nkrumah is the greatest Africa ever had. And that's why BBC voted Nkrumah as the greatest African of the millennium. Indeed, some people would have wanted to use the Nobel Prize as others would want at the basis to have what credited Nkrumah or qualified Nkrumah as the greatest in Africa or Africa ever had. But that is quite ludicrous because this is BBC that you know conducted, me, let me say, a survey in Africa and Africans in general came to the conclusion that Nkrumah is the greatest we ever had. And let me... So you think because the BBC says Nkrumah is the greatest based on the survey that they conducted, then for you he is? That is not the basis, and that could not be the basis, in the sense that, look, we were once somewhere before, before 1957, where was Africa? What was the state of Africa? We were in total what, abject despondency in this very, very continent. Everyone saw the black man as someone so inferior. We had the UGCC, Nkrumah broke out of it. 
and inspired a new confidence that in every generation you would have people who would do something so different. That's why through the youth he formed the CPP and told them that we need independence now. And so was it. But the independence struggle that was sparked by he in Chroma wasn't something that was limited to Ghana in the sense that the wave of independence struggle irradiated everywhere in Africa. You had, every, I mean, countries, other countries in Africa who thought that if Nkrumah is doing this in Ghana and he has actually achieved it, we can also achieve it. Okay. And let me point out that, you see, when you talk about Nkrumah, people think about physical objects. People talk about Akusumbo Dam, people talk about the Temamoto Way and all the mammoth projects they established. But let me put it on record today that the greatest legacy of Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah is the fact that he told all of us as black that the black man is not inferior to any other race. And you cannot have anything than that. But do we believe in that? Have you seen us acting on what he said? I mean, if it's the greatest legacy, as you say, that he left us. I think, quite frankly, we as a people have disappointed ourselves. Okay. Let, let, me, let me find out from Prince. What do you think? Is he the greatest ever? I think that if we were to judge him based on Manaf's standards, then I honestly think Nelson Mandela is the greatest ever on the African continent because he actually led a liberation movement that has made blacks in South Africa really believe that they are now equal to the whites, where people are marching and demanding for greater equality, something that you wouldn't see in Ghana because we are in a country where we realize people have inferior attitudes to the whites. But the thing I have with Nkoma being the greatest, especially even in the context of Ghana, that whenever we talk about Nkoma, we put him all together in one. But I think there were two phases of Nkoma that we need to acknowledge. The first phase of Nkoma being the Nkoma who was there for independence. And I think that man was a great man who helped us a lot as a country. But when you move to the Nkrumah after independence, who led Ghana, I think that is where the questions come in. Because if Nkrumah, like he said, was able to give us independence, that sent waves across Africa, that inspired other movements, similar movements across Africa. And you look at the fact that this same man was the one who was able to make the Ghanaian political system in a such a way that, and pardon me to say this on Founders Day, but he made the Ghanaian um, political system such in a way that there was no other way of bringing change on board than to go through a military coup. Because there was no avenue for anybody who was as intellectual as he was to be voted for or to be voted in. And the only way to... So we were more to becoming to, a, a one-party state. To, to bring change was through the barrel of a gun. And we all know the kind of people who held the barrel of the gun at the time. And uh, how So are you saying that he pushed them to do what they did? I'm, I said, I'm, what I mean is that even if he didn't push them per se, that was the only other way of bringing change on board. And that, you can see, brought about a series of other coups all over the African continent. Because if we can confidently say that Nkrumah inspired independence in Ghana, what is to say that Nkrumah didn't inspire all the coups? Because if the greatest Kwame Nkrumah had been overthrown by a coup, then who was Kenneth Kaunda? Who was any other African leader elsewhere? And because of that, if all of these things have inspired all these coups that have made Africa raided by plunderers like Mobutu Sesiseku, and because of that, Africa is so inferior that we are getting handouts from IMF on a daily basis, and everybody is portraying Africa in a wrong way. And the BBC, like he is saying, is one of the news media outlets out there who is really portraying Africa in a bad way. Then we, I think that we are feeling inferior. And no matter what he said on that platform, on the day on polo grounds that the black man is capable of managing his own affairs, we have realized today that the black man is not capable. We have realized today that the black man has become not capable, especially because of some of his actions that have spiraled all the events on the continent. And I think because of that, he may become the greatest because he was led by, he was followed by a lot of people who were really not that competent. But if he had been followed by a lot of other very competent people, looking at the resources he had and what he had left after he had left, then he wouldn't have been the greatest. I'm tempted to ask you, Prince, uh, is this a day worth celebrating and even, uh, you know, dedicating it as a holiday from this day? I think it's a day that is worth celebrating if it is Founders Day. That shouldn't be rallied around Kwame Nkrumah alone. Because if it is a day that is celebrated on his birthday and it is called Founders Day, then it makes Kwame Nkrumah look like he was the founder of Ghana. But 
the thing is that a lot of other people were there before Kwame Nkrumah came. And even the name Ghana, if it might interest you to know, was thought of initially by Professor Dr. J.B. Dankwa. So it wasn't like Nkrumah was the only person who was there to bring the country on board or make the country what it is today. I think that the Founders Day couldn't be celebrated and made something that honors all of the founders together or all the people who fought in the struggle rather than just mm. make one man the cult figure, especially make, um, honoring what he wanted to do, build a cult figure around himself. And that is what I think has ended us to where we are today. I think it is bad for us to give him that status alone and not mm. broadening it to everybody else. I've seen uh, Al Hassan uh, Tahiru Manaf wanting to say something to you, Princess Amwa. Yes, um, you know, when you spark this Nelson Mandela and Nkrumah comparison, it's just like comparing the well with the word sea. Nkrumah is Africa. Nkrumah was the representation of Africa in the world. Nelson Mandela is a product of a Western propaganda. This is someone who was so much exalted and put at that pedestrian that he didn't deserve. Because what is the state of the black South African today? I want you to look at the living standard of the black South African and compare it with You'll the living standard. You'll be talking standard. about the average black it, South African. Yeah, because look, in South Africa today as we speak, people don't have passion for education. Just quite recently, we all know of the Zenobia Are you putting aspect. all of them together uh, uh, and saying blacks don't have passion for education? No, that wouldn't I'm talking be about South Africa. We are discussing South Africa. Yeah, and I'm you saying understand? that to say that and generalize, that wouldn't be fair to the people of South Africa. Fine, you could say that, but I'm contextualizing the point I'm making, right? That quite recently, and I was even on that before you came in, you, you, you all know of this xenophobia attack. Nelson Mandela, South Africa, see the fellow blacks as enemies than even the whites who are taking over their own land. You think about uh, South Africans having the freedom, having the independence, no! You know, the independence struggle or the struggle for freedom in South Africa was shortcuts. Because someone somewhere sold out what they all held in high esteem. You get the point? So you just can't start it. You know, talking about Founders Day and whether it is worth celebrating, and even um, was Nkrumah the only person who championed the cause of independence, I think we have to learn from history. I'm not a, I am not a historian, but I've read books and you know, I've listened to credible sources. Nkrumah is not the only person who championed the independence struggle. And CPP is not the only political party that saw the need for independence. Even the UGCC also thought that, yes, we need independence. But when do we need it? And before the UGCC, we had the Aborigines' right protection. We have had other groups that what fought the colonial authorities just so that we could have independence. We are looking at the progressiveness the time consciousness that Nkrumah was, the sense of agency that he came in with, as far as the independence struggle is concerned. And when you want to talk about the present economic situation of Ghana, it has nothing to do with Nkrumah's legacy. And it has nothing to do... What, what he linked it to was the coups. If you're crediting him uh, uh, you know, with, with independence, yes. then you might as well also give him some credit with the coup situation. The coup situation, let's talk about it. Now, if you look at how polarized Ghana was then, this was a young country that just had independence. I hope you're with me. And uh, you had people who also had their own personal agenda to connive with Western security agencies to thwart the vision of this particular country. People were bent by hook or crook to make sure that a certain Nkrumah who comes from nowhere in a certain village in, in Zimmerland cannot lead we those who excuse me say come from a certain aristocratic background you understand and for that matter Nkrumah's government must come down and is it there's a point um, my good friend didn't raise and let me help him out with it because people, people as though he's asked for help Go ahead. yes uh, yes let's assume right <laughs> you understand look and it didn't come up with that very very point and I expected him to do because it actually formed force within the context of what? So, I mean, so what's that point? The point is that you, you could hear some of 
the Nkrumah critiques that Nkrumah declared a one-party state. I hope you have me. And that is one of the most laughable propositions to make as far as the history of this country is concerned because Nkrumah never passed such a law. It was the parliament. It was parliament itself that passed the law. And that was even made so because of the fact that you had a lot of evil and violent what, political activities ongoing. Which, which, which president would sit and cross his legs and tolerate bomb attacks for crying out loud? You have to protect the presidency. You have to protect the So law. how else were we going to get rid of him? How else? Or were we going to have other people compete with him? Was it that there was, not, there was no opportunity for people to compete in Chroma? Are we saying that? The same people... Well, what do you say? Because, because what do you say? Nkrumah contested a series of elections, and he won all. It was clearly the darling boy of the masses. Nkrumah was the darling boy of the people. That's why he had this much acclaimed, uh, much proclaimed title of Nkrumah the show boy. Why? Because he so easily associates with the people, with the masses. He made the point that he was talking about economics and the people around him, or, I mean, were inferior, and this, this, I mean, those who were competing were inferior. That is not very, very true. Because one, in this country, if you go to Harvard and come back and we think that you should worship that God, you have where you want to belong. And if you come back and you want to tell the ordinary Ghanaian that, look, I'm in this with you, and we shall overcome. And that is the strategy Nkrumah used. He thought that we are all in this what, colonial bondage together. We are all in this shackles of imperialism and foreign rule together. So, if we want to achieve independence, then it must be a, what, a network of what, progressives. And even after his independence, he made this quite clear that I'm relying on the chiefs and the people of this country to help me what, shape the destiny of this country. Mm. And again, he made the point that from now on, there is a new African in the world. So we must change our minds and our attitude. This is extra to what So to, to build on that, Prince, I'm coming to you now. How much of the mindsets have we changed since he said what he said? I think that a lot of, when you listen to a lot of Nkrumah followers or advocates, you get a lot of rhetoric and you get a lot of passionate statements. But really, we have seen passionate statements. And to talk about the thing about one party states, you see, it is very, very laughable when people tell you, oh, it wasn't him, it was, it was just the parliament. But we know how people ma manipulate these institutions. We know how people change Supreme Court judges when they want. We know how people loved Joseph Desiree Mobutu. But really, if you want to prove to us that you are the darling boy, he was the darling boy, and we established that darling boy, and he established that darling boy based on the fact that he competed in elections in 1951 and 1956 against people. That was how he established that he was a darling boy. But you realize that people's minds change, people's attitudes change. So for you to continue establishing yourself as the darling boy, you have to open it just like in 1951, just like in 1956, for people to keep continue affirming you as the darling boy. We were not saying that Kwame Nkrumah should be subject to two term limits. What we said, what we, what, what I mean was that Kwame Nkrumah should have opened it up. But even if there was no law, even if just let's say Parliament even never passed the law. When people live in a state of constant fear, when people live in a state where they feel like, okay, what could happen next to me? Because if JB Dankwa, who he started a struggle with, has died in prison, if this guy is running away from the country, maybe he had good intentions. And people always have good intentions, but we can never judge good intentions just on face value. We okay. can only judge good intentions based on the effect that they bring. And the effect that was bringing at the time was molesting for the people. And the people could not talk about their welfare. Okay. So, so because of that, we can never actually just talk about the fact that oh he brought all of the, these good ideologies and mm. these good ideologies and because of that he is worth just as much as he would want us to believe the good ideologies should have transferred should have made us believe in something okay. and that's what i say we don't see that now and because of that all that rhetoric about the new africa and the african is capable of managing his own affairs it's not there because is it of his IMF. fault is it his fault <laughs> it is not his is it his fault that we are where we are today well, not entirely. I will not put everything on him. I think he's a great man that needs to be celebrated. I'm not saying he's not should, should be celebrated. I think Founders Day should be celebrated yeah, with him as I'm, long as I'm, other people. I, 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 I want to move the conversation to what we face today as a country. Well, I think, like I said earlier, looking at 
the series of coups and everything that came. Mm. And the fact that we had no other alternative to change government, no other alternative of voicing out, rather than to throw him out with the barrel of the gun. And you realize that the people who held the barrel of the gun at that time were people who didn't have all the PhDs Nkrumah had. Nkrumah could have opened the floor for people who had PhDs like him, who could do as equally good as he, he could do, to also come up, be in the come for election and also be able to be voted for but when he limited that option to only people who had a gun and because of that we had a series of governments who deteriorated the economy so much to the point that ghana has had to go for loan after loan after loan and it will interest you to know that when the british were about leaving ghana ghana had the highest level of educated people in any british colony in africa but now ghana has just run about 60 percent literacy rate and countries like zimbabwe have 90 plus literacy rates, meaning that all these people were deteriorating our economies. And really, it was because of the actions of people like Nkrumah, who, were, who put an intimidating atmosphere there that if only you had a gun, if only you had force, that was when you would be able to come to power. Mm. And those are the guys who have deteriorated us. These are the guys who have made us beggars instead of being with Singapore that we were labeled with back in the 1950s and the 1960s. And because of all of these things, I think that Nkrumah was one of the contributing factors. Okay. We cannot put everything on him, but he was all one right. of the contributing Unfortunately, factors. I'm not giving time for rebuttals, but like just a Manav, second, I'm a second. asking, should we be here today as a country? Yes, we should be here as a country. Why? Yes, because first of all, if you look at the ancient tigers, or countries, especially countries in Asia, who have developed to this enviable, you know, limit or extent, you get to realize that there was a vision behind everything that they were doing or everything that they did. Ghana and the Ankoma had a development framework, and where is it now? You could talk for all you care. Nkrumah, you know, established a very fearful environment. No one voices out. But how can you go to the polls when the, there are bombs here and there? How can people go and kill and vote when people can just explode or detonate bombs and then everyone dies? You understand? So we have to revisit Nkrumah's what ideology. So Nkrumah had a plan. He had a plan. He had those a Those who came after him did not. The, the coup makers and those who are stomach centered thought that to go by Nkrumah's framework, development framework, to go by Nkrumah's vision, a president who even on his suit, he has written the property of the Republic of Ghana, then I'm going to starve to death. Come on. That's why today politics is seen as a money making venture. And you cannot... Is it just seen or it is? Well, I would say it's seen. I would like to use my own words in that manner. Okay. Yeah, it's seen as a money-making venture. And you cannot be in Chroma, and you cannot make Ghana what Nkrumah would have made it if you don't believe in his vision. His vision of selflessness. His vision of self-sacrifice. Today, people use state cars, and they turn them into their own property. State cars, of course. V8, why won't you turn it into your own personal property? But common suits, excuse my language, common suits. This is a president who wrote on his suit the property of the Republic of Ghana. And Kroma had a vision. If we want to develop Ghana, as other countries are reading the man's vision and applying it, we have to go back. Sankofa. We should go back to the plan that we had. Sankofa. And let's so on that note, I want to ask, we have a 40-year development plan now. What do you think? Yeah, I've, I've heard of 40-year development plan and the kind of you know, stakeholder consultation ongoing to make sure that it becomes a watertight document that every you know, other political party uh, makes the noise in manifesto, the, the noise in that manifesto is going to make use of it. And what would I want to see in the 40-year in, in the development plan eventually? Is that something that would even work? Uh, yes, I think that if the necessary stakeholders come to accept it, something for Ghana and, and, and the future generation is going to work. Because okay. others have it. Yeah. Prince, what do you think? I think that, um, just like I've always, always said, that Ghana doesn't deserve to be where it is today. I think Ghana could have done more. And when there's so much talk about, well, people came and they were greedy, and yeah, people came in, they were greedy. 
but those were results of the system. So I'm asking about the 40-year development plan that okay, we have now. Okay, the 40-year development plan that we have now. I think it's, it's, it could work. It could work. The, the, the thing Remember that this is not a legal document, so if you don't, it's not binding on anybody per se. Yeah, but it, 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 it depends on how they bring people on board. If you bring people on board and you make people feel included, then it has a higher chance of being accepted, especially when we look at visions by so people that were not possible to scrutiny and because of that nobody really believed in it apart from the person himself and people could easily throw it away they realize that whenever we are bringing a new development plan we shouldn't think like Kwame Nkrumah we shouldn't make it a, a, a development plan that is so not scrutinizable we should make it something that everybody can scrutinize bring their plans on board and that is the only way it's going to work other than just making things about me and myself and a court status and it's the NDC that brought it it's the MPP that brought it collective collectiveness that's all i believe in mm. Let, let's get on to you know that drastic measure of yours that the the young people of today and the leaders of, that we have today we're all the same yeah uh, and nothing will change really even if we if we got rid of them let first of all let me ask of your opinion then i have an interesting question to ask him what do you think well 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 <laughs> it's, it's it's a multi-billion dollar question that you have asked because Fine, I believe in Ghana, I believe in the youth, myself as a youth activist. But that is not to say that we don't have some serious challenges down there. Especially if you look at the student politics these days. You know very well that today most of the young politicians we have in this political party started from the student representative council. Mm. And I just want to make some quick points for you to appreciate that if we don't take quick measures, we may end up plunging the future into even more serious damages or what okay chaos. but do it very quickly one you have you could have an SRC president who believed that his administration should be governed by what friends and cronies so if there is any contract to be awarded maybe printing of books or whatever should be given to the sister two you have an SRC president who feels that let's go on a social trip and then they give out tickets to girlfriends and all that you understand all, all this is happening you have you know, bloated budgets, and when you quiz them, they'll be doing this merry-go-round and have their way through. So what would happen if you eventually get the opportunity to serve at the high level? If you have, as I say, let's say, being raped, what won't happen at the high level? So I think that some of these things should, what, should, should be addressed or tackled as early as possible. And I want to see the new Africans, the, the progressive ones, the young ones, forming a network. And you know, those days, even when Nkrumah was in Achimota College, they had these study groups. And it was not just about how to get a job and wear suits, put on tie, and sit in air-conditioned building, but it was how to make Ghana a better place. So if we could form these study groups on campuses and, and, and then reshape the thoughts of, the, of, of our thoughts, mm. I think that we, we, we could go, I mean, far places, because with the little I've read about Nkrumah, when I was the graduating class president of Valley University, in fact, I think that our achievement was a mammoth one. And it was all inspired by what, by what I've read about Nkrumah okay. and, and, and how I see the man. I see the man in, in me. And, okay. And, you, you know, see Nkrumah in you. I see Nkrumah That's in very me. deep. I like that a lot. Prince, finally, um, this, your prescription of those children who will be born in 2015 taken somewhere else so that we don't influence them uh, or affect them by our thinking and, and, and the way we do things in our country today. Look at the prescription that he gave. It looks like that could work. I, 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 although mine is so hypothetical, I shudder to think, I, I think mine has a higher possibility of working than his will on any day. Because I think that when you tell me that a, a solution has to be brought or the challenges have to be met then I ask myself who is going to do that is it the politician who is up there who is funding the students to become the SRC president and because of that will rig the elections for the student to become the SRC president so that he can have influence in the school who is going to effect that change or is it the guy who is who wants to rig the election so that he can have the inflated budget's mother who is going to advise him not to do it or who is going to do that and when you tell me that we should form a network who is to tell me that you what is the criteria for forming that network and how do you screen people who have all these ill intentions from coming in because you will never know the intentions people have until they get the power 
And that is why it is so difficult for those things to work because it is already in the system. We have all these nukes, we have all these alliances where people who are intellectuals come and they profess all of these good qualities and in the end they don't do anything. So I think those are what he said is not really a solution that we have to look to. It's something that is already existing that is already not working. So so you, you, for you, I mean, you think it's, it's just one way out. It's just one way out. We have to have a new breed of people and just be resolved. That until then? This breed, until then? Until then, we'll, we'll keep going to the IMF. We'll keep going back there to the IMF. What, what's your dream? Because you are young people. You are still in school. What's yeah. your dream? What do you hope to achieve? I, I personally, I study economics. So I want to do international economics. And I think that... I was having a discussion with Manaf earlier before we came in, and I was telling him that we should start hiring people outside of the country. We should start hiring South Americans. We should start hiring Asian economics, people who have no interest in the politics, to come and work for us. And that is something that I want to do. So we need people, expatriates. People who are not politically influenced, people who are not in, have, who don't have interest in, so that they can manage things for us. So for instance, I want to do international economics so that I can go to a country like Sri Lanka, go anywhere where I am not biased, where I don't even know their political system. So eventually, system, so Prince Asamoah, you don't even want to work in Ghana. Not because, not, it's not like I don't want to work in Ghana. What I want to do, I feel like if I'm here, there's always a chance of somebody influencing me. There's always a chance of somebody want, making me go against my principles. Okay. And I, I don't want to antagonize those people a lot because I realize that if I were in their position, I'll probably do the same thing. So I don't want to put myself in that position to even do what they're doing. So I want to get out there and help people so that Amazing. other people out there can also come and help us. Okay. And then we develop us well. But now, what, what do you hope to achieve? I want to position myself as a technocrat in this particular country. I have an accounting background. I want to build on it to do my professional course to become a chartered accountant. And from there, hopefully go to the law school because that's my dream. Okay. And I, I, I want to position myself, as I said, as a technocrat in the sense that everything in this country is about decision making. And yeah. if you don't have the right kind of persons to take good decisions for the country, how then do you get out of your problems or okay. troubles? So yeah. that's, as he said, and you don't go to IMF and stuff. Yeah. But you know, going right. out and Nkroma is, you know, I don't really love IMF. But <laughs> I have my own position on IMF. Okay, you that will be on another day. But thank you. You guys have been very amazing. I wish you the best in the dreams that you carry. Only the best. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, stay with us for Talk, which is up next.